Okay, so I'm going to start off uh, where Dan left off with reference to King's Beyond Vietnam speech in which he laid bare the relationship between U.S. wars abroad and racism and poverty being challenged by the civil rights movement at home. This is a quote. I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. In that speech, he also said, quote, I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. And he said, a nation that continues year after year to spend more, military, more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And I always ask myself, are we dead yet? Last month, in just over a week, we experienced two shocking US military strikes and an alarming increase in tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Two days after major newspapers reported that a chemical attack had occurred in a village in Syria, killing and injuring many civilians, the US launched 59 cruise missiles at a Syrian airbase the first direct military attack against the government of Syrian President Assad. This, despite the fact that there had been no investigation by any international agency that might confirm a chemical weapons attack occurred or who was responsible and in violation of international law. This bombing was unquestionably welcomed by most of the mainstream media and democratic leadership in Congress. Bombing apparently is considered presidential. On April 13th, seemingly out of the blue, the US dropped a 22,000 pound bomb on an ISIS or Daesh cave complex in Afghanistan. This so-called massive ordnance air blast bomb or MOAB, misogynistically called the mother of all bombs, was the largest non-nuclear bomb ever used by the United States on the battlefield. And I think it should be called the FOAB, the father of all bombs. You know, what signal was being sent and to whom? The next day, the National Nuclear Security Administration announced the successful field test of a B-6112 nuclear gravity bomb at the Nevada test site. Meanwhile, amid speculation about a potentially imminent nuclear weapons test and several missile launches by North Korea, tensions on the Korean Peninsula have risen to the highest level in decades as US and North Korean officials posit threats and counter threats of preemptive military strikes. Even hawkish former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta warned, quote, we have the potential for a nuclear war that would take millions of lives. So I think we have to exercise some care here. <laughs> this isn't the only nuclear flashpoint. Tensions between the United States slash NATO and Russia have risen to levels not seen since the Cold War with the two nuclear giants confronting each other in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and Syria, and in an accelerated tempo of military exercises and war games, both conventional and nuclear, on both sides. The US, the only nation with nuclear weapons deployed on foreign soil, is estimated to have 180 nuclear weapons stationed at six NATO bases in Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey. In June of last year, the largest NATO war games in decades were conducted in Poland. The exercises came weeks after activating a US missile defense system in Romania and groundbreaking for another missile defense system in Poland. Russian President Vladimir Putin warned that there would be, quote, action in response to guarantee our security. And sure enough, in October, Russia moved nuclear-capable Iskander missiles into the Kaliningrad territory bordering Poland and Lithuania signaling its response to NATO, while at the same time claiming it was a routine exercise. Russian officials have previously described the role that the 500-kilometer range Iskander system would play in targeting US missile defense installations in Poland. Then at the end of January, amid concerns about Donald Trump's commitment to NATO, 87 US tanks, 144 armored vehicles, and 3,500 troops took part in a demonstration of NATO firepower in Poland. According to General Ben Hodges, the commander of the US Army in Europe, quote, 
This is the largest ever US deployment in Poland, and it's about deterrence. An outright attack by Russia is unlikely, but the best way to keep it unlikely is to do what we're doing here today." End quote. Russia, not surprisingly, saw the deployment as a, quote, serious threat, according to Putin's spokesperson. And former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev warned, quote, it, looks, it all looks as if the world is preparing for war. And as he wrote in Time magazine, quote, more troops, tanks, and armored personnel carriers are being brought to Europe. Uh, NATO, I'm sorry, being brought to Europe. NATO and Russian forces and weapons that used to be deployed at a distance are now placed closer to each other as if to shoot point blank. Now, at the moment, Donald Trump seems to have a warm and fuzzy view of Chinese President Xi Jinping. But at the same time, the US is facing off against China in seas where other Asian nations are contesting Chinese territorial claims. And just this week, a US Navy warship sailed within 12 nautical miles of an artificial island built up by China. This so-called freedom of navigation operation is the first such challenge to China under the Trump administration. And India and Pakistan remain locked in a nuclear arms race amid mounting diplomatic tensions. Derek Johnson, executive director of Global Zero, has recently stated this. This is an unprecedented moment in human history. The world has never faced so many nuclear flashpoints simultaneously. From NATO-Russia tensions to the Korean Peninsula to South Asia and the South China Sea and Taiwan, all of the nuclear armed states are tangled up in conflicts and crises that could catastrophically escalate at any moment." End quote. An accidental or intentional military incident could send the world spiraling into a disastrous nuclear confrontation. A great danger is that the rulers of one nuclear armed state will miscalculate the interests and fears of another, pushing some geopolitical gambit to the point where economic pressures covert actions, low intensity warfare, and displays of high tech force escalate into regional or general war. And this vulnerability to unintended consequences, I think is reminiscent of the circumstances that led to World War I, and I'd like to ask Adam about that later. While our ability to discern what's actually going on is shrouded in an unprecedented web of intrigue and a blizzard of propaganda, there can be no doubt that the dangers of wars among nuclear armed states are growing. But I don't want to talk about Donald Trump. I want to talk about the continuity in US nuclear weapons and national security policies. Trump's ability to launch massive military strikes on a whim while threatening global annihilation within the first 100 days of his presidency was only possible because of the vast military industrial complex he inherited. This continuity is exacerbated by Trump's shifting more authority over military operations to the Pentagon. <clears throat> On December 22nd, 2016, President-elect Donald Trump ominously tweeted, quote, the United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability until such time as the world comes to its senses regarding nukes. In February of this year, uh, President Trump said, it would be wonderful, a dream would be that no country would have nukes. But if countries are going to have nukes, we're going to be at the top of the pack. Um, his initial budget request signals his administration's intention to prioritize reliance on the nuclear threat. So while it's only a small portion of his proposed $54 billion increase in military spending, the $1.4 billion budget increase for the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, which oversees nuclear weapons research and development, is a proportionally higher increase at 11% than the 8% increase the Pentagon would get. Trump's 2018 budget request for weapons activities under the Nu National Nuclear Security Administration at $10.2 billion, quote, to meet the administration's requirements to modernize the nation's nuclear weapons stockpile and infrastructure is almost 11% higher than the 2017 level. And I want to be very clear that that does not uh, include many, many billions more for delivery systems, which are under the Department of Defense. 
So in an increasingly volatile world, this is consistent with US national security policy in the post-World War II and post-Cold War eras, despite the dramatically changed geopolitical context, uh, conditions. Now, if you cast your, mind back, your minds back, many of you will remember that during the 1980s, fear of nuclear war was by far the most visible issue of concern to the American public. In the early 1980s, thousands of people rallied and were arrested in nonviolent acts of nonviolent protest. Yet following the end of the Cold War, nuclear weapons, and especially US nuclear weapons, fell off the public's radar screen. Meanwhile, deeply embedded in the military industrial complex, Pentagon planners and scientists at the nuclear weapons labs conjured up new justifications to sustain the nuclear weapons enterprise. Following the sudden collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Colin Powell, then chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, declared, quote, you've got to step aside from the context we've been using for the past 40 years that you base military planning against a specific threat. We no longer have the luxury of having a threat to plan for. What we plan for is that we're a superpower. We are the major player on the world stage with responsibilities and interests around the world. In 1997, nearly 10 years after the Cold War ended, President Bill Clinton signed Presidential Decision Directive 60, reaffirming the threatened first use of nuclear weapons as the cornerstone of US national security and contemplating an expanded role for nuclear weapons to deter not only nuclear, but chemical and biological weapons. The Bush Doctrine of Preventive War was a continuation and expansion of programs and policies carried out by every US administration Republican or Democrat since 1945, when President Harry Truman, a Democrat, oversaw the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. His soaring rhetoric notwithstanding, President Obama left office with the United States poised to spend $1 trillion over the next 30 years to maintain and modernize its nuclear bombs and warheads, the submarines, missiles, and bombers to deliver them, and the infrastructure to sustain the nuclear enterprise indefinitely. Over the past couple of years, the US has conducted a series of drop tests of the newly modified B-6112 gravity bomb at the Tonopah test range in Nevada. The Russian foreign minister has declared these tests provocative. The B-6112 has a selectable yield, making it, up to f making it up to four times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. It has a new tail kit, which provides precision guidance. This capability, along with the selectable yield, raises concerns that it be, could, could be considered more militarily usable. Each new bomb will cost more than twice its weight in solid gold. And of the 481 B61 bombs slated to become the B61-12s, approximately 180 will be deployed at the six NATO bases in Europe. Trump's 2018 budget request includes $10.3 billion for 70 F-35 Joint Strike Fighters, which will be capable of carrying these bombs. Pentagon, budge Pentagon budget documents show that the F-35A is scheduled to be certified to carry nuclear weapons in fiscal year 2025. And this illustrates the long planning horizons in the military and among the nuclear planners. So more than a quarter century since the end of the Cold War, nearly 15,000 nuclear weapons, most in order of magnitude more powerful than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, more than 90% held by the US and Russia, continue to pose an intolerable threat to humanity and the biosphere. Recent studies show that a nuclear war involving 100 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs dropped on cities could produce climate change unprecedented in recorded human history. A drop in average surface temperatures, depletion of the ozone layer, and shortened agricultural growing seasons would lead to massive famine and starvation, resulting in as many as two billion deaths over the following decade. Now the good news is, <laughs> I knew you were waiting for good news, is that much of the world has come to its senses regarding nuclear weapons. In December of last year, over vociferous objections by the United States and Russia, the United Nations General Assembly voted to hold negotiations in 2017 on a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons leading to their elimination. 
Incredibly, here's how President Obama's UN ambassador, Robert Wood, explained the US objection. Quote, a treaty banning nuclear weapons will not lead to any further reductions because it will not include the states that possess nuclear weapons. Advocates of a ban treaty say it is open to all, but how can a state that relies on nuclear weapons for its security possibly join a negotiation meant to stigmatize and eliminate them? He said that on the floor of the United Nations. It's available in writing. The first week of the negotiations took place at UN headquarters in New York, the last week of March, with 130 countries participating. On the opening day, Trump's US ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, held a press briefing outside the conference hall, flanked by nuclear allies, including the UK and France, and claiming to represent almost 40 UN member states, Haley, proudly identifying herself first and foremost as a mom, a wife, and a daughter who wants to keep her family safe, announced that they will be boycotting the negotiations. <laughs> so I am rethinking whether maybe the mother of all bombs isn't so wrong after all. <clears throat> a draft treaty was released earlier this week, and the ban treaty negotiations will resume on June 15th at United Nations headquarters in New York City. It is anticipated that a treaty will be agreed upon by the close of negotiations on July 7th. And I do want to mention that the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, founded by Jane Addams uh, over 100 years ago, is the umbrella organization uh, organizing a women's march to ban the bomb on June 17th in New York with sister marches around the world. But how are we to understand the meaning of a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons leading to their total elimination if no nuclear armed states participate? So I want to quote from a statement made by Iran uh, in May to a review comp session for the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. This is what Iran said. Iran, by the way, was the first state to renounce nuclear weapons and join the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty in 1970, yeah. Quote, reiterating our full support for negotiating a comprehensive convention on nuclear weapons to prohibit their possession, development, production, acquisition, testing, stockpiling, transfer, use, or threat of use, and to provide for their destruction, we would like to stress that the ongoing United Nations conference to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons leading toward their total elimination should be considered a collective protest by a large number of non-nuclear weapon states parties that are frustrated from 47 years of non-compliance of the nuclear weapon states with their nuclear disarmament obligations. We hope that this situation would compel nuclear weapon states to come to the conclusion that they cannot remain consistently inconsistent with their nuclear disarmament obligations. This indeed is an alarming situation and cannot continue indefinitely. That's the end of the Iran quote. To realize, yeah. To realize the full value of a ban treaty, we must demand that the nuclear armed states recognize the existing illegality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons under international law protecting civilians and the environment from the effects of warfare. The governments of these states must finally act to meet their disarmament obligations under Article 6 of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and customary international law and participate in good faith in the negotiations as unanimously mandated by the International Court of Justice in its 1996 advisory opinion. I'm almost done. You can put that down. <laughs> However, it's unlikely that much progress will be made on nuclear disarmament until there is a significant trend towards demilitarization in general. In 2016, the United States spent $611 billion on its military, more than twice as much as China and Russia combined, amounting to 36% of world military spending. The bottom line is that security must be fundamentally redefined. Instead of national security, the security of the nation state, premised on the threat of overwhelming military force and nuclear annihilation. We need a new concept of human security 
defined by a previous head of the United Nations Development Program as, quote, the security of people, not just of territory, the security of individuals, not just of nations, security through development, not through arms, security of all the people everywhere, in their homes, in their jobs, in their streets, in their communities, and in their environment. This new concept of human security is, quote, universal, global, and indivisible. Addressing nuclear dangers must take place in a much broader framework, taking into account the interface between nuclear and non-nuclear weapons and militarism in general, the humanitarian and long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war, and the fundamental incompatibility of nuclear weapons with democracy, the rule of law, and human well-being. Nuclear disarmament should serve as the leading edge of a global trend towards demilitarization and redirection of military expenditures to meet human needs and protect the environment. We must reject the apocalyptic narrative and summon the imaginations of people everywhere to envision a vastly different future. There's no inevitability to the course of history and a mobilized citizenry can redirect it toward a positive future. Progress towards a global society that is more fair, peaceful, and ecologically sustainable is interdependent. We are unlikely to get far on any of these objectives without progress on all. But these are not preconditions for disarmament. Together with disarmament, they are preconditions for human survival. In our relationships, both with each other and the planet, we are now hard up against the choice Dr. King warned about 50 years ago, nonviolence or non-existence.